Hey folks, welcome to the Buckle Up Podcast, the Millennials Guide to the BRI. I'm your host, Enzo Kong. The focus of today's episode is the beautiful Balkan country, Albania. Albania is a founding member of the Belt and Road Initiative and actually goes way back with China as partners. My guest for the discussion today is Yetno Kasmi. Yetno is an Albanian researcher who studied at the Korean Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management and has a keen interest in Asian politics, soft power diplomacy, and middle power diplomacy. Our conversation reveals that more work needs to be done locally in order for the BLI cooperation and investments to stake. We also talked about the prospects of Albania's EU accession, which might have a positive impact on business between Albania and foreign investors, including China. Finally, we explored how the Albanian youth can benefit from the Belt and Road Initiative and what we can do to engage them. Yetno is super insightful. I myself have learned a lot from the episode. Please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so and enjoy the conversation. to see you yet no how are you doing thank you very much Enzo. thank you for inviting me me in this it's a it's real good pleasure it's our pleasure too um you know the thing about albania is that it might be one of the most beautiful country that we'll ever cover in this series <laughs> is, is there a place you'd say i cannot miss if i have the good fortune to visit your country uh, well there is several nice uh, sites unfortunately we have more beachy areas to offer than mountain areas. So depending on the individual's um, unique perspective, but I would say the Southern Riviera and the cities of Saranda and Dora, which are the, let's say the prettiest and the most invested on due to their connectivity with Greece and other major uh, roads. The North is not so invested on and will hopefully uh, have the government do some more work on that. But the South uh, is definitely better. And are they close to where you live? Uh, I live in Tirana, and then the Vlora is about two to three, two to three hours away, whereas mm. Saranda is about four hours away. But uh, there is fine. Yeah. major infrastructure development, so it might be shorter. Okay. Well, um, I'm sure most of our audience would like to learn a bit more about um, the general politics of Albania before we jump into the, the main theme of our podcast, the Belt and Road Initiative. So currently, the... Prime Minister of Albania is Eddie Rama. He was holding his office for the third time. And can you tell us a bit more about his politics? And it seems that EU accession would still remain on the agenda. Is that correct? Um, uh, well, the, uh, the EU accession is always the way forward as it is wanted by most of the Albanian society. And it has been promised by the uh, Albanian leaders since the uh, fall of communism in the 1990s. Uh, regarding Adirama, now honestly, um, uh, his politics are quite uh, closed. You know, he's, he runs a tight ship and not, no one really knows what is going to happen today or tomorrow, despite the fact that we are supposed to be quite a decentralized government. Uh, the prime minister still holds a really tight grip on power, so to say, or political appointees. In that regard, I, that. Uh, worked in the government at the ministry for about one year and a half, too. Uh, it was still difficult to distinguish on uh, what were the real policies and what we were doing. We were just, you know, the administration just does its work, but it's difficult to understand what the political side is, you know. And then one issue was more important than the other, depending on the political will or depending uh, on how fast the papers got pushed. Uh, regarding the third Rama administration, I'll have to believe that, well, up, on his political campaign, he basically said, we won't change anything, we'll just continue as we are, so vote for us because it's going to be better than the others. You know, uh, it's kind of a self-confidence a leader gets when they've got, when, when they've stayed too much um, in power. They've got nothing more to promise, but um, uh, just a promise that they'll continue what they started, you know, not let them have their job uh, be cut in half, so to say. Uh, in regards to the EU accession, um, uh, I'll, I'll highlight again that it's still what the Albanian people want. 
and it is still uh, the government, let's say, main objective. Uh, currently, all of the all of the ministries have established, let's say, task forces or um, uh, not a task force, but ad hoc committees in in uh, in working in let's say coordinating all the ministries together in order for the um, uh, EU accession to be facilitated easier in the sense that all the Albanian laws need to, to be transposed to the European laws. Uh, so when uh, we access on it, the let's say keys that the Albanian standard of living will increase and then we will go to Europe. But it's not, uh, let's say that Europe, let's say want us to increase this, it's for us and then in order for us to get, let's say, a better uh, standard by the rule of law, and then we can join the EU. But ultimately, uh, it is a um, uh, thing that we have to do ourselves and then go to the EU, so to say, if the EU is a place to go for. And the country has already been an EU candidate since 2014, is that right? Uh, a candidate in the sense that um, uh, Let's say uh, you get a university exception, uh -huh. or let's say you apply for a university and they said, okay, you're a candidate and you can apply, but you still have to apply and get accepted. All right. Again, and then you... the, the application process takes a while. And for us, it has taken, I don't know, a lot of years. And then during my tenure at the government, we actually got the green light on opening the negotiations. So we've been participating in uh, the pre accession talks, so to say. Hmm. So they're not accession talks, but they're pre-accession talks and explanatory chapters in Brussels, to which I had the luck of representing the, the government for one chapter. And then in those meetings, the European Commission explains to the government or to the governmental representatives as to what is going to happen on the chapter, like which are the laws that needs to be transposed first, uh, how the rules of the game are going to change once the uh, Albania joins the EU, uh, what is the needs, what are the priorities that need to be tackled first and all that. And then after uh, 2019, I think I wrote a paper about this, um, we got, let's say, from we moved from 10 or 5 um, uh, key points that we need to accomplish before joining the EU to 14 and to 15. And it is becoming to me like, uh, I have a historical joke about Woodrow Wilson's uh, 14 points. On the, League of, on the League of Nations, in which uh, George Clemenceau says, um, uh, Mr. Wilson bores me with his 14 points, even God requested 10 commandments. And then, you know, we are all breaking them. So in the sense that uh, they are increasing our uh, to-do list, and then the people are getting uneasy as on whether or not this to-do list is quite important. Uh, but the majority of the stuff in the to-do list is the establishment of the rule of law, uh, the establishment of independent, let's say, courts, independent um, uh, prosecutors, and basically uh, tackle corrupt, corruption. And then um, uh, I think one, uh, one important key is the trial, the high public officials that are, let's say, um, uh, corrupted or have been embezzled in funds or things like that. Mm. Well, the reason I asked about EU is because it obviously has an impact on um, um, Albania's cooperation with the BRI, because when we talk about the EU standards and the politics, definitely that, that, that has an impact. But we'll go back to that later. Speaking of Albania-China relations, um, they actually go way back. Because when China, the PRC was established in 1949, Albania was already having close ties with the country. So can you tell us more about um, how the relationship started and how it's developing at the, at the moment? Um, the thing is that um, Albania was one of the most hermetic countries during communism. Um, for about 50 years, uh, we were quite close with the Soviet Union when uh, Stalin was in power. Um, our our uh, communist leader or whatever, Ember Hoxha, uh, uh, traveled to, let's say, Soviet Russia about five to six times and produced many memoirs and books of that, of those meetings, uh, most, most of which are, um, uh, let's say, uh, fairy tales. If you can compare, uh, let's say, the proceedings from the Soviet Union and the proceedings from Albania, and if you compare the papers, 
Uh, and then after the uh, death of Stalin, and then after the uh, Soviet Union was, let's say, switched their policy into a more open one, and then the uh, Albanian started, uh, let's say, collaborating with China as it was the only country that could provide technical support and, uh, and assistance. Uh, in that regard, uh, the Chinese and Albanian relationship have been, have been ongoing for so many years, but they further deepened when uh, Albania, sponsored by the um, will of the Chinese, a uh, resolution in the UN, for the one China policy that we have now, right. in removing the Republic of China, also known as Taiwan, right. to the People's Republic of China, in the uh, in the uh, United Nations, uh, that ultimately led to Taiwan being expelled from the UN, a status that still holds today. Uh, <clears throat> you know, honestly, um, uh, I think or I believe strongly that. Uh, we did not have a choice in regards to who we partnered with in back in the day, uh, and due to this, uh, let's say, collaboration that we did with China and this uh, deal in the UN, we were able to receive, let's say, a lot of technical assistance uh, in regards to technology, education, um, uh, food production, or whatsoever. And in that sense, we had many. Um, uh, Chinese experts and engineers coming here and helping us develop antennas and uh, radios and uh, broadcast tractors who were assembled in Albania. And also there was an exchange program, meaning that a lot of uh, Albanian students were sent to China as students. The same thing was happening with Russia. Uh, and then in order to get trained in China and then brought back here to somewhat use, that, um, uh, uh, use the skills learned in the Chinese uh, education system here in Albania. Uh, so that's, that's how it has been for a while. Well, that sounds similar to what some, some of the things that are happening on the ground right now when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative. So um, Albania was actually a founding member of the 17 plus one framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. And they further agreed to expand cooperation under the framework in 2017. So, but when we look at what's actually happening in terms of um, specific sectors, for example, if you look at the transportation sector, things have been uh, rocky to say the least. Um, for example, when we look at the acquisition of concessionary rights of the Tirana International Airport by a Chinese joint venture led by China Everbright in 2016, um, and by concessionary rights, it, it means you basically operate the airport, and that comes with certain responsibilities. But um, the thing is, we have seen repeated security failures in the airport, such as armed robberies since the acquisition. And it was considered that the Chinese company was responsible for that, but the Albanian government was um, not able to hold them into account, hold, hold them accountable. And that certainly did not please the general public. And eventually China Everbright sold its entire equity in the, joint, in, in the air, airport to a local Albanian group called Kastrati. So Yetno, can you tell us what do you make of the whole saga? Well, the transportation sector is actually one of the most important keys to our economy as we highly rely on it. Um, uh, we are seen as a bridge between East and West in the sense that let's say uh, the harbors that we operate or the roads or the airports are let's say the driving factor to our economy. Uh, in regards to the, uh, the airport concession, um, uh, it has actually been rocky for a while now, not just, not, just on the, um, uh, not just on the security side, but also let's say on the duty-free shops or, or other legal rights mm. that the airport has. Um, uh, you know, the airport rents its shops and its spaces to, to companies and all that. Uh, most of them have been halted due to, let's say, legal procedures or whatever. Uh, let's say the um, the Chinese company that was managing the airport, they actually um, had other people manage it for them, you know. Uh, and in that sense, um, we are used in a country that if you don't have it well with the system, then the system uh, spells you, so, or to say the least. 
And then this new venture by Strati Group, it's not, let's say, new. Um, uh, they are somewhat built in the country. Uh, mm. they, have, they have some of the most important, let's say, projects in the country in regards to infrastructure. So the new acquisition of a uh, huge, let's say, um, uh, portfolio by an Albanian company, it's no surprise meaning that they have been getting a lot of tenders and a lot of uh, money from the Albanian government in regards to their investments in, um, uh, in the economy or in the infrastructure, which is uh, quite shady if, if I am to say so. Uh, we even had, let's say, other foreign companies that have left the country because of the difficulties on in conducting business. Mm. And then this is not good for the foreign direct investment or any other kind of investment because it doesn't produce trust. Uh, we had, let's say, Sheraton, uh, the Sheraton ho hotel, hotel chain network that, is, mm. that have been operating for many years. Uh, they've left a few years back and then the Catalati company bought, let's say, the hotel where they used to um, operate from. So I feel this, this is like a trend of replacing, let's say, big companies with more small controllable companies, I'd say. Uh, it's something that it's not really uh, nice in regards to the infrastructure development or the political development because it doesn't make us look trustworthy. And then the other thing in the, the rocky part with the Chinese investment is the, um, uh, the procurement from Bankers Petroleum from the GOJ in the southern right. of Albania. Uh, what is to be said about that region is that the region is very, very poor. Uh, despite having the the land that produce oil, you think that some of the money that generates that will go for the local economy. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, instead, most of the money is being, let's say, taken, uh, so to say, by the central government, and then uh, most of the taxes go to the central government instead of the local government. And then most of that money, or most of that money, or whatever is produced there, it doesn't spill over to the local population. What spills over to the local population is the <laughs> Is the pollution caused by the by the refineries? Uh, despite, let's say, public um, uh, uh, unsatisfaction with, let's say, the company or with the petroleum company uh, leaking uh, harmful materials in the water supplies or in the rivers or whatever, uh, the government or the local government kind of uh, fails in, or in keeping them in checks and balances and fails in um, keeping them accountable according to law and according to, let's say, uh, legal procedures. Uh, and then there is, this is a funny anecdote, which is quite true, but man, it's funny because it's true. Uh, and once, every, once every New Year, then this company or their directors, they just go with uh, 50 dollars worth of groceries and they give it to these families and they say this is corporate responsibility and we like to give back to the citizens so they're, they're um, providing them with little baskets of food while they are uh, somewhat damaging their uh, agricultural sector so it's a little bit um, um, hypocritical if you'd ask me uh, so in order for this investment from either Chinese companies or any other companies to be successful, there needs to be a sort of mutual respect between the local, the local communities, the government, and also the companies. Um, if, if, if a country does not, let's say, impose checks and balances on the companies that operate in its own uh, territory, uh, then the population is going to be dissatisfied, and then uh, the climate of conducting business is not going to be healthy to say the least so obviously the central and local governments could um, do better to make the investment stake but on the other side do you think the chinese companies have some lessons to learn from these failures well it's not just the chinese companies that have lessons to learn i think um, the lessons that are need to be learned here is that you know you should be very careful getting into business with a um, uh, let's say, a government or a country that does not have a good track mm. uh, in upholding investments. And this is one of the issues that we are, let's say, lacking for indirect investment right now. All right? We don't have most of the investment that we have are from Turkey, some are from China, and then now we're getting, let's say, investments from the Arab world, such as, such as the United Arab Emirates. 
oh, well, uh, which, would... which these are, let's say, to say countries that, you know, don't really want to operate within the legal spectrums of things. Mm -hmm. And, well, we have talked about the transport transportation sector as well as the energy sector. And there is another sector which, is, which might be less controversial, which is the agricultural sector. And China has been keen to welcome more exports from um, Albania in this regard. For example, Premier Li Keqiang confirmed the ab abolition of any barriers to imports of honey, wine, and olive oil coming from Albania when he met the PM in 2019. But um, you've also told me the other day that there might be some um, problems regarding the exports by Albanian uh, Albania in terms of the regulations and the standards. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, we do we do need to export more, let's say, agriculture, as agriculture and tourism are some of the key drivers of our, of our economy, as the transportation and the energy sector is quite lacking, to be honest. Uh, in regards to the agricultural sector, we do have, let's say, good produce. What we lack is the standardization of control. Uh, and that being said, meaning that uh, there needs to be a tighter control, let's say, in the farmers, uh, in the farmers and what they produce and what they export. Uh, generally, uh, the majority of the farmers uh, operate in, let's say, small businesses, and then there is this big, let's say, uh, conglomerate, so to say, that they takes the produce and then, um, uh, let's say, makes olive oil or whatever. So. Uh, they're kind of little, little corporations that, that handle the, the, the production. Uh, the fault at this is that uh, there is a lack of standardization in government control in this regard. And then since the government is quite bendy, uh, you could easily get the ISO or you could easily get the certificate of approval uh, without, you know, without much effort. Uh, We've had issues in back in the day when we, were, when we were exporting honey to countries like Saudi Arabia or when we were exporting, let's say, livestock, uh, such as sheep uh, or honey. And then in the conversations I had with um, uh, back in the day with uh, Saudi investors, uh, they were basically saying that the honey was really, really good at first. They passed all the quality control and all that stuff. But then for some reason, the people who were selling it or who were exporting it, they got greedy. Uh, so therefore, they were they were inserting, let's say, shady practices like, such as I don't know antibiotics or sugar or any other uh, uh, effort or any other measure that is used to increase the production of honey. So by being, let's say, greedy or by wanting to produce more and increase the quantity, they they lowered the quality and then that kind of um, uh, made the investors to not procure honey anymore or any other. Uh, Produce, uh, so this is the uh, the issue. Um, there needs to be a tighter control and tighter security in regards to the um, uh, standardization of the of the produce. Whereas in regards to fruits and vegetables, I think uh, they are they are quite okay as we export in Europe as well. However, with uh, honey and wine, which they need to be kept at let's say better standards, they might be issues so do, um, do you think who is who is responsible for setting these standards so better regulate the market and could um, the EU accession change this because we know that EU has a very robust set of standards regarding produce when they talk about brexit they they said that the shape of the banana was also regulated under the EU rules so would that be applicable here Actually, one of the good things about joining the EU, the EU is the compliance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the government is hard, working hard or hardly working, uh, depending on how you see it, in regards to transpose all the laws and regulations to the EU, to comply with the EU, meaning that majority of our laws, uh, let's, let's say regulate agriculture, food, produce, or whatever, are set that uh, compliance with the EU. The problem is that we look good on paper, but we don't look good on uh, the field, so to mm. say. So if you read if you read the papers and the laws and everything, everything uh, 
we have signed all the important treaties, but the lack of uh, application thereof is, is uh, quite unsatisfactory. Uh, so it's not just a compliance, it's, uh, let's say you, you have written a law, or you have written a book or whatever, but if you don't distribute that book, then nobody was going to know what you wrote and how you wrote it and uh, how it uh, helps future generations if they read this book. So in that, in that sense, it's the same with the law. So if you write the law and then you don't provide, let's say, uh, a good deliverable system in which everybody can understand and learn, about, learn from the law and learn the law, then it's going to be difficult to implement it. So this is one of the main issues, I believe, not just the compliance. Or the lack of a law. Mm. Now, speaking in the Bell and Road Initiative in general, um, I'm sure it can avoid from the geopolitical struggles. And we've talked about some regional um, problems, such as um, Albania's relationship with the Middle East and Turkey. Can you elaborate more on that? And can you maybe also talk about the Albania's relationship with the US, who mm. has been, um, you know, on the opposite of the bench? regarding um, the Bell and Road Initiative? Um, well, Albania, is, it has always been on the uh, kind of the middle uh, because it, as a young country, it wants to attract all the investment it can get. But on the other side, uh, it needs to somewhat um, decide who they're going to go with. In that, in that sense, that the fact that we are still not a EU country, we have the opportunity to choose and, or to pick and choose. Uh, similar is being done with Serbia as well. Uh, they are, let's say, pro-Russia or they have a big Russian support, but they also want to join the EU and they are on the final stages of the EU accession, you know. Uh, so they can, we have the luck to pick and choose. Uh, in, that, in that regard, I'm... Uh, we are just, you know, getting what we can, um, which which is quite funny, so to say. Uh, in regards to the EU being on the opposing side of the bench, I think the least, the latest developments kind of show that Albania is somewhat orienting more to the EU uh, and to the US. But then again, the recent development with the construction of the harbor in Duras, which which is a tender or given to the um, I think the company that constructed Burj Khalifa and the company that constructed Belgrade by the water in uh, Serbia uh, kind of sets things in a different way. Uh, on the other hand, we've had a lot of big Turkish investments, uh, specifically before, right before the elections. Uh, they promised a lot of vaccines, and they promised to build a hospital, uh, and they promised to build an airport. Uh, in Vlora, which didn't go the right way. So now an Albanian company or an Albanian from Kosovo that has been working in Russia and Kazakhstan a lot is planning to build it. So there is a lot of um, uh, odd things going on, so to say. Uh, so there is not a consistency in which you can draw uh, a line or there is no consistency in which you can draw, let's say, conclusions. Uh, so we're still adapting as we go in that in that regard. Mm. I don't know. I I spoke a lot. I don't know if I answered your question or if or if I was understood well. Well, but still, that's the pragmatic approach. When you're a small country, the best thing you can do is to try to be independent as possible and benefit from the opportunities coming from both sides. So now, finally, we ought to talk about the young people. And back in 2018 and 19, we have seen some student protests in Albania. Um, it started off as an opposition to the high tuition fees, but it ended up in a cabinet reshuffle. Can you tell us what is this, what is it all about and what are the most pressing issues facing the youth in your country? Well, the cabinet reshuffle, um, to be honest, they just changed the minister to a vice minister. So in that regard, the policy that was fallen was the same or similar. Uh, so there was not much of a reshuffle in that, in that regard. And then since the government is quite centralized, then the majority of the power rests with the prime minister. He appoints ministers and he appoints vice ministers. Uh, 
uh, and a vice minister is somewhat a made up role which in the government because it does not really it's not really specified well in the constitution uh, so the vice minister is usually an individual who is supposed to be leading a sort of uh, field of area of expertise in a ministry but um uh, more they usually um uh, they just handle some sort of di different because tiers. Uh, and the vice ministers are very changeable. Mm. So, so they don't create much of a um, uh, fear in the public administration, so to say. Uh, so that's, that's about the government reshuffle. Uh, but what the student proto protesting brought up is that, um, uh, you know, it was quite scary in the sense that they got up so fast and things escalated so quickly. But then again, uh, like like every other protest that's been happening in the country, if you keep the track of it, you'd see that the government won almost all of them, won in the sense of negotiating power. So if you're in a protest and you have a, uh, let's say, a protest control group, meaning the people who will negotiate for you in the government and set your points, your 15 points or 10 points, or whatever, um, uh, whatever means that you are trying to accomplish by this protest. And then you go to the government and then you, let's say, try to negotiate this. But your negotiating power is way lower than all that of the government. And then usually through strong hand measures, the protests are usually um, uh, brought down. Similar thing happens to the protest in 2018 and 19. Uh, they said that, yeah, we are going to provide jobs and employment to young students who are excellent students, meaning that they, they open more than 600 government jobs to excellent students, uh, which is a good initiative, meaning that a lot of them got employed and a lot of them are really good students. But this is not the right way to go. So, okay, you protest and I give you a job and then you stop protesting. So it's kind of a blow to the students who are not, let's say, excellent students meaning that not, not everybody can afford to get good grades in, a, in an uneven society in which the uh, lack of internet access or the, or the lack of access to education is not the same in the capital or in the other different districts of the country. Uh, so what this created is that um, uh, it kind of drove excellence, so to say, but then again, the students who are not able to get an absolute 10 they are not able to, let's say, get a, get, a, get a good job or be promoted. And it basically said, it basically brought this excellency kind of um, uh, idea is that if you work hard, then you'll get a job in the government. But then again, the job that you'll get in the government is kind of going to, it's going to be mediocre to say the least. Uh, and then a lot of people that believe that by working in the government, they're going to be able to be rich or be powerful or whatever, but then again, there is a big ruling elite or of public administration that doesn't matter how, how hard you work, it's still going to be where you started. You know, it's a bureaucracy, it's very set to keep you where you are. Uh, so I don't think the student protest really changed much aside from uh, employment of a few of their peers. And then uh, in regards to youth again, the lack to education and the lack of employment after education is actually one of the biggest factors as well. Uh, for instance, we have changed the educational system a while back from a four-year high school to a three-year high school, mm. and then from a four-year university to a three-year university plus two years of a master, meaning that the students spent up until 23 or 25 years old in school, because after they finish university, uh, with a three-year bachelor's degree, they have little to no opportunities of getting employed because there is an inflation on degrees. Everybody has a master's degree and everybody is getting a PhD. Uh, and most of those degrees are somewhat shady and plagiarized. But, but that's another issue. Uh, in regards to the education, uh, most of the students who graduate, they have a master's degree and they have no job experience. And the majority of, the of them, they do not want to work in, let's say, uh, meaningless jobs because they have a college degree but they have no experience. So in that sense the high level of education is somewhat decreasing unemployment because if you're a student you're technically employed and you're a student but then again with this new education that they're getting uh, it's still pushing the, um, uh, the unemployment rate just 
one year and the other year and the other year. So there is a big bubble of, let's say, of um, inflation in regards to the diplomas and in regards to the needs of the country. So the diplomas that they get or the degrees that they have do not directly correspond to the needs of the economy. Because and, there is no standardized regulation. For that. And in that regard, um, in terms of education and job opportunities, could the Belt and Road in Initiative provide a little help to the young people in terms of education and exchange programs, maybe? Uh, well, to be honest, um, I haven't really seen what the government plans on getting from the Belt and Road Initiative. Even in 2017, when the ambassador of Albania in China signed the memorandum or contract, call it what you want. Yeah. Uh, when I was there, I uh, I wrote to the ambassador and I asked specifically, like, what does Albania seek to get from this agreement? Uh, but <laughs> there was no response from him or from the uh, from the ambassador from from the embassy. Uh, and then again, the majority of Albanians don't really know about this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so there is no public discourse in the country regarding it. And I, as a researcher that have been working on this, have been researching it and wrote a book chapter on it. I have no idea what the government expects. I can just only speculate. So in regards to the opportunities that will offer young students, it's highly doubtful since um, uh, the majority of Chinese, let's say foreign direct investments, let's say comes into construction and or um, uh, raw material industries, uh, such as mining and all that stuff. And then the spillover that will leave to the local uh, population, it will just be uh, uh, short-term uh, labor or labor-intensive jobs, such as digging and trenching or whatever. In regards to the youth, I highly doubt that it will have any uh, impact um, whatsoever. Uh, yeah. So there isn't a lot like you who has spent time in Asia and China. I mean, did you, did you, so you, you just took the initiative and plan on say, oh, I want to go to study, take a semester in Korea and China, and you didn't really get a lot of help from the authorities? Um, actually, there are a few scholarships offered by the Asian universities. So to say there is the next scholarship from Japan, that's a TGSP scholarship from Korea, and then there is a single governmental scholarship from China, uh, in which they offer, let's say, to developing countries one or two scholarship bases per year mm. in order to start the other bachelor, master's, or PhD in these countries. Uh, in that regard, uh, a lot of the students that I know who have been traveling to Asia have um, uh, have gotten one of these scholarships. However, uh, it's just the number of the people who have applied to the scholarship is very low. Oh. Uh, and then the number of the scholarships is limited. Whereas my role, my role, my route to let's say Asia was different. I was studying in the US back in the day. And then I got offered an exchange semester from a Korean, a Korean university mm. to study there. So my path was somewhat different than, than uh, uh, an Albania that lives in Albania would have taken. Uh, and since the majority of Albanians are focused on either going to Europe for their exchange or their universities, uh, since you know Europe is closer and uh, the government kind of recognizes better the European and the American university diplomas, the uh, the young students don't necessarily turn their eyes back onto the uh, east, so to say. So in that regard, if Belt and Road in the future would provide, let's say, more study scholarships with the help of the government or the universities in China, as I said, there is a top 10 universities in China, which are at the highest, uh, the Times Higher Education ranking uh, would provide, let's say, scholarships, then I guess um, with the soft power provided by education, the youth might be able to, let's say, contribute more and foster a better relationship. But as it is, uh, it's quite difficult. Right, because as far as I know, there, there has been some academies in 
China, especially in Peking U or the Tsinghua University, which are catered or tailored for students from um, the Belt and Road countries. So I'm sure they are welcoming, but the problem may lie in how you promote the programs and provide incentives for the st students to come. So that's definitely more work to do. Now, mm -hmm. before... Hmm. Yeah, please. I was going to say that in regard to the, the most of these universities that tailored that say scholarship, not just the Belt and Road countries because it's still new, but for the Silk Road countries, which is different thing. Right. So it's not Belt and Road countries, it's Silk Road countries. Right. Uh, similar, the similar is with um, Chinese universities and also with the Korean universities. Hmm. That, they, that they offer scholarships, let's say, to the Korean diaspora in the Central Asia. So they're mostly targeted to their um, uh, areas of influence back in the day. Right. Now, before we leave, yeah, no, can you have, can you provide us some general recommendations on how the Baton Road can move forward? And what's your prediction on what's going to happen between Albania and China? Oh, this is tough. I mean, I mentioned a little bit of on it in my earlier points in regards to the future um, uh, uh, roads, so to say. Um, uh, and since there is a lack of information being provided by both governments, either the Chinese embassy here or the Albanian government here or the Albanian embassy in China, then it's difficult for the public to somewhat understand what is going on. Mm. Uh, if there is no public perception in this regard or no positive public perception in regards to China, then I think it's going to be, well, there's not going to be a future whatsoever. Uh, although China is trying so hard with its uh, soft power diplomacy to somewhat influence the countries uh, by either offering, let's say, money or uh, investment uh, or um, skills, um, I think the some of the practices of the FDI that's been conducted uh, has, let's say, left the countries in debt. Well, I have a figure here. Um, between 2016 and 2019, the number of stories related to the BRI published in Albanian media jumped from 42 to 194. But that's 194, that's still, still far too few, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the majority of the stories that are published are somewhat, let's say, vanilla, vanilla stories, meaning that they don't really show the entire picture. They just mention small specifics. Yeah. Uh, I've read many of them when I was doing my research and I've read and I actually participated in 2019 in a uh, 17 plus one uh, capital cities that gathered in Tirana in order to hold the conference. On uh, on this on this regard, I think the representatives from the uh, Chinese uh, cities were participating. I think it was Beijing, and also the Albanian uh, mayor of Tirana participated mm -hmm. in in events held in Beijing as well. But honestly, the I don't have much information about the proceedings of this meeting or what happened or what was it for. Uh, it, it, it left a big question mark as I participated in the initial event, but then again, uh, I didn't even know what to expect and what was going to happen and what was the follow up of, of this. But then again, uh, we've had quite some hindrances in the economy because of an earthquake in 2019, also the coronavirus and this mm. and that, but which might have somewhat halted the, uh, the development of, let's say, projects or other things. Uh, which is one of the reasons why there is not much, let's say, public opinion regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but so far, so far, I, I don't know much. I'll be honest on that. And I don't want to just make assumptions. Mm. Well, thank you very much for your insights today. Um, Albania is on the top of my bucket list. So I hope to see you there soon. Well, thank you. And we'll keep in touch. Thanks, Edno.